Welcome back everyone. In our previous lectures we went over the steps of hypothesis testing as well as how to construct and interpret a confidence interval. All of these are at the core of inferential statistics. We work with sample data and we're trying to use that sample data to draw conclusions about what's going on in the larger population. Well in this lecture we're going to take a look at the possible outcomes of hypothesis testing. Because remember, we're working with sample data. So even though we're doing our best to draw accurate conclusions, it's possible that we may draw accurate conclusions or we may be wrong sometimes. So we're gonna break this down by talking about first, the true state of the population, sort of the theoretical, if we were all seeing, all knowing, what's really going on in the population. Then we're going to talk about something that's a little bit closer to what we've been doing, the researcher's test decision, rejecting HO, failing to reject HO. We're then going to move on to some of the possible outcomes, type 1 errors, type 2 errors, power, and explain the value of knowing the probability of getting into any one of those outcomes, as well as the importance of power to the realm of statistics. I'll finish up this one with a few practice questions um, that let you practice on your own. The reading, as listed at the bottom of the slide, Chapter 4, Module 8, Chapter 5, Module 9, from the fourth edition of your course textbook. So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's go to the next slide. As researchers, we work with sample data. I've said that over and over again, and I'm hoping it's starting to sink in by now in an attempt to draw conclusions about the larger population. That's the crux of inferential statistics. We start with a small sample, and we want to use that information from the sample to make estimates or draw conclusions about what's going on in the, the larger population. But as we've also talked about, whenever you work with sample data, you're never going to have 100% certainty about the accuracy of your findings. But we have to remember that there is truth out there. Now, as researchers, we don't get to see that truth, but that's the goal of science, right? You want to be able to discover universal facts to uncover the truth. So we are gonna do our best using statistics to find the truth. So one side is, let's take a look. What is really going on, AKA the true state of the population? So there are two possible truths. One, in a hypothesis test, either the null hypothesis is true, meaning there's no effect, there's no difference, there's no change, so that law enforcement strategy doesn't reduce crime rates. Nothing happened. Um, that particular drug didn't shorten the duration of an illness. Nothing happened, right? So either the null hypothesis is true, or the second of our statistical hypotheses, the research hypothesis, H1, is true. And that's what we want as researchers. We're hoping to, to uncover significant effects, significant differences, significant changes, whatever it is. So two possible outcomes, either the null hypothesis is true or the research hypothesis is true. Now back to what we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. As researchers, we go through a hypothesis test. At the end of that hypothesis test, we have to make a decision, as we have talked about in previous lectures. We either, as is shown here with step one, we either reject the null hypothesis and conclude that H1 is true. So in other words, this is saying that we have found enough evidence to suggest that there is a significant effect, there is a significant difference, there is a significant change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. That's step two, or not step two, but option two. Failing to reject the null hypothesis, we conclude mm, nothing happened. There's no significant effect. Or usually the way that we say it technically is we say that there is not enough evidence to suggest that an effect, difference, et cetera, exists. So we as a researcher at the end of our hypothesis test and that's step six, we had to pick one of these two outcomes. So now let's go on to the next slide and we're gonna take a look at how the truth, quote unquote, and the researcher's test decision sort of compare against each other. So let's move on to the next slide. On this slide, we have a table that breaks down the comparison of the truth, the true state of the population, 
versus what we as researchers decide at the end of our hypothesis test, which is the researcher's test decision. So looking, starting at the left-hand side of this table, we see the researcher's test decision, and then in black bold font next to it, we have the two decisions we can make at the end of a hypothesis test. We can either fail to reject the null hypothesis and say we found nothing, there's no evidence of a significant effect, etc. Or we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that yes, we found a significant effect, we found a significant difference. So those are our two outcomes. The true state of the population the, the bold in the tops of the columns, we see an HO is true and H1 is true. Those are the true possible outcomes in the population. So either the null hypothesis is true, in fact, and nothing, there's no effect, no difference, or the research hypothesis is true and there is some significant effect or significant difference. Well, this comparison and contrast between the researcher's test decision and the true state of the population creates four possible outcomes. So what we see here that I have listed is four boxes numbered with red numbers. So one, two, three, four. Those are the four possible outcomes of a hypothesis test. Let's start with when we get correct findings. So boxes one and four are correct. Why are they correct? Well, they're correct because the researcher's decision matches the true state of the population. So number one, let's look at number one. Number one I say is correct. Why? Well, the researcher's decision was to fail to reject null hypothesis. So we couldn't reject the null hypothesis, so we said not enough evidence to say there's a significant effect or difference. And sure enough, when we look at the true state, HO was in fact true. Nothing was going on. There was no difference, no effect, anything along those lines. So that's a match. We said nothing's going on. The true state of the population said nothing's going on. That's correct. Although it's not that exciting. We say, oh, we found nothing and we were right. Well, great, all right. So let's move on to number four. Box four is the exciting box. This is the box that we as, as researchers and scientists want to land in. Why? Because it's when we say, wow, we found something. We found a significant effect, a significant difference. And sure enough, we were right about it. It is so powerful in the realm of statistics and research that we give it a name. Box number four is called power. And we'll be talking about that in a little more detail later. So what happens to land in the power box? Well, our test decision is to reject the null hypothesis. So we reject the null hypothesis and go, oh my goodness, we found something. There is a significant change in average weight of male and mates, or there's a significant difference between these two groups, or this pill had a significant effect on some sort of illness, whatever it is. We are excited, we think we found something. And sure enough, the H1, the research hypothesis was in fact true. So that's the match there. Unfortunately, because we're working with sample data, it's also possible for us to make errors. We may not have a correct outcome to our hypothesis test. These are seen in boxes two and three. So let's look at these ones. Let's look at box two. Box two, if you land there, is known as a type two error. And a type two error is when we as a researcher fail to reject the null hypothesis, we conclude, there's no effect, no difference. But in fact, if we look at the true state of the population, H1 was true. H1 means there was an effect, there was a difference. But you know what? We failed to detect that and we missed out on an opportunity and that's a type two error. On the other hand, the final box we have here is box three. Box three is known as a type one error. And a type one error is when we as a researcher get excited because we reject the null hypothesis, we think we have found a significant effect, but then when we look at the true state of the population, uh-oh, we were wrong. In fact, the null hypothesis was true and there was no significant effect. So once again, an error was made, we, we refer to it as type one. The final thing I'll say about this slide is by looking at HO is true column, and then next to it, the H1 is true column. The HO is true column includes boxes one and three. And you'll notice I have type one error in box three, and then I have alpha in parentheses. 
And for box one, I have correct, and I have one minus alpha in parentheses. Why do I have that? Well, those go hand in hand. Alpha, you may recall from our um, hypothesis testing lecture, is our level of significance. The degree of rarity required to reject the null hypothesis. And we set it at 0 0.05. So we can control that column. And so the probability of committing a type 1 error, alpha, we can set that. We can set it at 0.05 or 5%. Box one goes hand in hand with that. If we're willing to accept a 5% chance of committing a type one error, then box one, one minus alpha would be 0.95 or a 95% chance of landing there. On the other side, we have H1 is true column. That's boxes two and four. There we introduce a new character. Here we have the Greek letter beta. Beta is the probability of a type 2 error. And you'll notice that we have likelihood of landing in box 2 is beta. And then power, that one that we really want to land in, is 1 minus beta. Well, the unfortunate thing about beta that we're going to see in the next couple slides is it's much more complex than alpha. In fact, there's a sort of a give and take between alpha and beta. Type 1 error, type 2 error. And so we're going to talk about the complex nature of, of beta and type 2 errors in just a bit. So let's go into each one of these boxes into a little bit more detail. So let's move on to the next slide. So as we just learned, there are four possible outcomes of any hypothesis test. Two of them are correct decisions and two of them are errors. We're going to start by looking at the errors, type 1 and type 2 errors. Type 1 error, the pure definition is when we falsely reject the null hypothesis. So as researchers, we reject the null hypothesis. We think we have found a significant effect or difference, but in fact, nope, we were wrong. There was nothing going on. Oftentimes, this is referred to as a false alarm. We think we found something, difference, effect, or a change, but in fact, we were wrong. There was no significant effect. So the term false alarm comes from that. The nice thing about a type one error is we as researchers have control over it because the probability of committing this error is alpha. And we've seen alpha in our hypothesis testing. As researchers, we get to set alpha at whatever level we want. The typical level is 0 0.05. Therefore, the probability of committing a type one error is 5%. Next slide. The second type of error is a type 2 error. This occurs when we falsely keep or retain the null hypothesis, or as we've been saying so far, when we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we as researchers go, hmm, I didn't see anything, I don't see a significant effect, but in fact, there was a, sign there was a significant effect, but we missed it. So the term miss is often associated with a type 2 error. And reading from the bullet point, we think there was no significant difference, effect, or change, but we were wrong. There was, in fact, a significant effect, and we missed it. Now, the probability of committing this particular error is referred to as beta. Unfortunately for us as researchers, we don't get to set beta by ourselves. It's more complicated than alpha. And actually, there are five things that can influence beta. And we're going to talk about those in a few minutes once we talk about power. Because you may recall from the slide where we had the table of the four possible outcomes, and we saw that beta and power are closely tied together. Let's go on to the next slide. All right. Here's where we want to land. This is what I said a few minutes ago. Power, power, power. We want to discover new things. We come up with a new medicine. We want to know, does it have a significant effect on the duration of some illness? Um, we come up with a new law enforcement patrol strategy. We want to know, does it have a significant influence on the crime rates in a neighborhood? Um, we want to ask if we have different types of rehabilitation programs for substance abusers. We want to know, is there a significant difference between two competing rehabilitation programs? As researchers, we want to discover new things, 
And that's what power is all about because our ability to accurately detect these effects is known as power in the realm of statistics. So let's go a little deeper into that. Next slide. So as mentioned previously, power is the probability of accurately detecting an existing effect. Okay. And in any research study, you want to have the highest level of power possible when you're designing your actual research study. In fact, if you're seeking um, grant money in order to run a study from the NIJ, the NIH, or any of these other federal or national agencies, oftentimes they ask you to show what your expected level of power is. Um, typically, the level of power they're looking for is a, a level of power of 0.8 or higher. Um, we'll save that for another time, but for right now, we want to have the highest level of power possible for any one of our research studies. But there are five factors that actually influence power, and these are listed here on this slide. And we're going to spend the next couple slides going through each one of them. The first is the size of the effect that you find in your study. Um, the second is the amount of variability in the particular data that you're collecting for your study. Number three is alpha. And so alpha, power, beta, they're all connected together. And we'll talk about that seesaw battle in a little bit. Um, sample size is also plays into power. And finally, a term called balance. And balance is used when you're comparing two different groups in a particular study. So let's take a look at each one of these five factors that influence power. Let's go on to the next slide. All right, the first factor that influences power is the size of the effect, the difference. And in its simplest sense, a larger effect equals a higher level of power. So a larger effect equals more power. That's a simple way to state it. But let's take a look at an example. Down below on, in the blue boxes, we have two studies, two imaginary studies. And let's keep this really common sense and just see what our natural intuition tells us about them. All right, in study one, let's say that we're comparing two different groups on some outcome. So maybe we're trying to see does, you know, our, does one group perform better on a test than another group or whatever it may be. So for group one, the mean for that group is eight. For group two, the mean is 12. Well, what's the size of the effect or the difference in that particular study? We see that in red, the size of the effect is four. Okay, so there's a four point difference between the means of these two groups. Let's compare that to study two. Study two, we imagine that the mean for group one is still eight, but the mean for group two is 15. So now the size of the effect or difference for this study is seven. 15 minus eight is seven. And we notice that in study two, we have a larger effect size than we did in study one. That translates to more power for study two. And one of the things I want you to understand is think about it just in a common sense fashion. If you had to go tell the world, wow, we found a difference, and it doesn't matter whether the difference was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but whatever. We found a difference between two groups because you know there's gonna be a little error. So your, your number is never gonna be a precise estimate, but it's gonna be close. So you're going, okay, we want to declare to the world that we predict in the population there is in fact a difference between these two groups. Well, which one of these studies would you have more confidence in making that proclamation? And I think most of us would agree it's study two. Why? Because we saw a bigger difference between the two groups. We're not saying it's exactly seven, but we're saying there's a better likelihood in study two that there's some sort of difference going on between the two groups overall. Thus, we have more power. Let's move on to the, set, the next step. Second factor that influences power is the amount of variability. So this is the amount of variability in the individual observations that you're getting from your sample respondents, from your, your people, your subjects, whatever you want to call them. Okay, so a simple way to, just for memory purposes, a larger amount of variability equals less power. All right. So let's take a look at our example in this case. In this one, let's look at study one. In study one, let's say that we collected observations from five people. Maybe we're counting number of prior arrests, maybe we're counting score on a quiz, who knows. But we get these five observations from five people. 
one person had a value of three, one person had a value of four, another a five, then a six, then a seven. Those are our five observations. Well, looking at that, if we were to compute the mean for study one, the mean is five. And the standard deviation is 1.58. Okay. Study two, we once again collect five pieces, five observations from individuals. But now the numbers are slightly different. So now we have an observation of a one, a two, a five, an eight, and a nine. So for this group of five individuals and their scores, one, two, five, eight, nine, we compute the mean. Well, sure enough, the mean is five. So both study one and study two have the exact same mean. But does that mean that they're similar? Or are there, is their mean accurate and trustworthy and reliable um, representation of what's going on in that group. Well, in study two, you'll notice the observations are more spread out. And in fact, if we compute the standard deviation, the standard deviation is 3.54 for study two. So the key thing to focus on in this one is, even though the means are the same in both study one and study two, the key thing that changes here is the amount of variability in each study. Study two has a larger amount of variability, 3.54, and therefore it has less power. So once again, I always like to bring it back to what's the common sense takeaway from this. Look at study one, three, four, five, six, seven, a mean of five. Most of us, I think, would agree that that five looks like a pretty good representation for that group, a good summary of what's going on in that group. We look over at study two, that mean of five is not as good of a summary of what's going on in that group because there's more variability in the observations. We have people who are four points below, four points above the actual mean value, and they're not nearly as clustered tight, or tightly clustered together as they were in the previous study. All right, let's move on to the third factor. Factor number three that influences power is alpha. Okay. This is one you just gotta kind of just get it, understand it, and go forward. You're not gonna see a nice fancy sample or a blue box on this one. Um, you just gotta understand it. All right, alpha is our probability of committing a type one error. On the other hand, we have beta. Beta is the probability of committing a type two error. Well, in statistics, you can't have it both ways. And what I mean by that is you can't reduce a type one error likelihood at the same time as reducing the likelihood of committing a type two error. No, in fact, it's a seesaw. If you reduce the probability of committing a type one error, you're actually going to increase the probability of committing a type two error and vice versa. So how does that tie into power? Well, since power equals one minus beta, reducing alpha will in effect, will also reduce power. How does that work? Well, if we reduce the level of alpha, we increase the probability of, of beta. If beta gets bigger, then the power one minus beta becomes a smaller number. So in that essence, we're reducing power. Therefore, when we look back to how does that relate back to alpha, look at this third bullet point on this slide. Therefore, a study with an alpha of 0.05, which is what we typically start with, will have more power, all else being equal, than a study with an alpha of 0.01. Why is that? Well, if we're willing to accept a 5% chance of committing a type one error, with an alpha of 0.05, if we wanna reduce the likelihood of committing a type one error and reduce it down to 0.01, we're unfortunately going to increase the likelihood of committing a type two error or beta, and therefore one minus beta, which is power, that value goes down. So the takeaway here is as you reduce alpha, you also will reduce power. Moving on to the next slide. Number four, sample size. Sample size is pretty cut and dry. Here, a larger sample equals more power. So think back to your research methods class or just your common
common sense and, and intellect when you think about research. A larger sample typically is going to be more representative and more accurate about what's going on in the population. I think most of us would agree with that. If I have a large, if my, if you look at a study and go like, oh, it's got a huge sample size, like, okay, I'm going to trust the results a little bit more than a study that comes from a very small sample size. That's how it relates to power too. So a larger sample equals more power. So look at two studies. In our blue boxes in study one, imagine somebody says, oh, we're, we're reporting the results of a study that had a sample size of 50. And here are our results. And you go, okay. Study two comes along and they say, well, here are our results. And they go, and our study came from a sample size of 5,000. All else being equal, most of us, I think, would agree that we're going to look at study two and go like, wow, you sampled 5,000 people as opposed to 50? I'm going to trust the results of study two a little bit more than the results of study one. And in statistics, it directs, directly relates back to power in the same way. So a larger sample, as we see with study two, equals more power. Let's move on to the final factor that influences power, which is balance. Next slide. All right, here is balance. So balance, so far in the class, we haven't really talked about the notion of balance, but it's not too hard to comprehend. Within the next lecture or two, we're going to be talking about comparing two different groups, uh, men versus women, property offenders versus violent offenders, uh, Coca-Cola drinkers versus Pepsi drinkers, whatever, right? We're often going to be um, comparing two groups. So balance is all about whenever you're looking at a study where you're comparing multiple groups on some sort of outcome, balance is all about, well, how balanced are the sample sizes? So keep it distinct from factor four, sample size by itself, and think of it as, well, is there a balance between the groups being compared? The outcome here is, as we see with the black bullet point, more balance across groups equals more power. So let's take a look at our example. In study one, we have pretty good balance between the two groups. Uh, group one has 45 people. Group two has 55 people. Now, is this perfect balance? No, but it's pretty good balance. You have a pretty good representation of enough people in group one, enough people in group two. And so you're hoping the story is, is that they're telling is roughly as accurate as, as it can be given the balance. And the total sample size is 100. All right, so I say there that we have more power for study one. And then let's contrast that with study two. Study two, now once again, just think common sense here. Imagine that the sample size for group one is only 15, so pretty small. And then the sample size for group two in this study is 85. Do you dis I hope you see the disparity between the, the balance here. 15 people, representing one group and 85 representing another group. Well, whose story is going to be told better? Whose story is going to be more representative? What's, what's really going on with that group? It's probably going to be group two and group one is not very well represented. And this lack of balance throws off our ability to be accurate in detecting the overall effect. So even though the total sample size in study two is 100, which is the same as it was in study one, the balance is off. So study two has much less balance, therefore it has less power. Study one has more balance, therefore it has more power. Okay, so that's the possible outcomes of a hypothesis test. We talked about type one errors. We've talked about type two errors. We've also talked about this great thing called power and the five factors that can influence power and how they can influence it. The next couple slides, I'm not going to have any um, sort of narration going over them, but they give you a chance to practice um, some of the concepts that we've covered here. So the, as you move on to the next slide, you'll see some questions. The slide that follows it will have the answers, and then you'll have one more slide with questions, one more slide with answers, and hopefully that will help you to understand these concepts. So take care.